I find that whenever I begin an endeavor, great or small, that I always begin by raising my eyes up under the heavens from whence cometh my help. That I was colored by the Lord across a vast and furious ocean. That I did cross with my wife, my charge of children, my wife, her kin. And in the years intervening, the Lord hath so very smiled upon me. But my heart and my spirit always resided upon Cape Cod. And so it were, I did purchase unto myself some great tracts of land wherein I might start a town unto myself. And so it were, when I did come unto this place, unto Manamoyet, it were with no small ambition. So it is from such small beginnings great things can come. The beginning and the end of the fantastic Chatham 300 video are the words of Richard Pickering of Plymouth Plantation performing as William Nickerson, the first English settler of Chatham. Appropriately so, and to our family association's great delight. But the story of William and Ann Busby Nickerson and their family did not start in Chatham. As you have already been shown, William and Ann started in Norwich, in the East Anglia part of England, and near the English Channel. A large proportion of the English immigrants to America in the 17th century for, were from East Anglia. Unlike the Welsh, Cornish, and people from other parts of the western coast of England, East Anglia was settled and ruled by the Danes in the time of the Vikings. It is not unusual that the name Nickerson has a Scandinavian structure. Possibly that Danish heritage made them less loyal to the English rulers, Angles and Saxons themselves in London. Protestant Reformation was strongest in this area, and religious freedom, something the Salem Puritans did not honor so much when they got here, was some of the strongest in England at this time. Much of colonial New England can be attributed to the East Anglia immigrants. The New England accent is one, but more importantly, the 17th century buildings followed those of their home area. Education and family were important in East Anglia, and the early Massachusetts settlers were typically family groups. Like East Anglia, New England communities were self-governing. The church was the most important building in the 17th century towns, and in order to become a town, as Chatham did in 1712, there must be a congregational church and a sitting minister. William and Ann Nickerson may have come to America more because of Ann than of William. Accompanying them on the voyage was Ann's parents, Nicholas and Bridget Busby, which means that any of us Nickersons, like me, who are 12th generation Nickersons, are also 13th generation Busbys. The large family group traveled on two vessels, with father and son captains, both named William Andrews. The two ships were the John and Dorothy and the Rose. We don't know too much about those ships, but they were probably not that dissimilar from the Mayflower. Whether or not the Busbys and the Nickersons already knew family or friends that had already immigrated, we do not know. They arrived in Salem in 1637 when Salem was the largest English settlement in the New World, then eclipsing even Boston in size. In fact, that same year, the first military muster took place on Salem Commons and is considered the beginning of the U.S. Army. William and Anne brought with them four children, the oldest Nicholas being nine. We do not know too much about the first three years in the New World. Anne's parents moved to Newbury shortly after they arrived, and there is a presumption that William and Anne may have lived with them for a period of time. A few months later, the Busbys were in Watertown. William Nickerson was made a freeman in Boston in 1638, which leads one to believe that they were settling with or near Anne's parents during this period. Regardless, it is presumed that William and Anne were living in the Boston area between 1638 and 1640. By 1640, William's family was residing in Yarmouth in the Fallens Pond area, then called the Little Bass Pond. The Plymouth colony at the time was considerably more tolerant than the Puritans in Boston and Salem. By 1641, William had taken an oath of fidelity to the Plymouth Colony. By this time, William and Anne's family had expanded to six children, with their son Nicholas, the oldest, being about 13. By 1647, their family would include nine children, Joseph, my ancestor, being the last. A weaver in England by trade, William had become a planter in Yarmouth, which had good soils for farming. Yarmouth had only been settled in 1639, so William and Anne were among the first to be farming land in Yarmouth, and their farm probably included land in the area now known as South Dennis. It was in the 1640s when William was about 40 years old that he became a thorn in the side of the authorities on Cape Cod and the Plymouth Colony. 
He is cited numerous times in court records and occasionally fined for his behavior. At one point he met Miles Standish because one of the more famous pilgrims was called to Yarmouth to settle a land dispute in which William was involved. There were numerous times that William was involved in legal action, but by the early 1650s he was maintaining a low profile. That was not to last because he decided to trek eastward for virgin land so he did not have to suffer his neighbors. And here is where the Chatham story begins. William felt there was no room to expand in quickly growing Yarmouth, but East Ham settlement had vacant land in the area of Monomoyak. Meeting with Sachem Mattaquassan in about 1655, he made a verbal agreement regarding land in today's Chatham port. The payment to Mattaquassan was a shallop, 10 coats of trucking cloth, six kettles, 12 axes, 12 hoes, 12 knives, a hat, and 12 shillings in money. In June 1656, word got out about the deal and some probably jealous English settlers brought William to court. The court case blundered along until 1657, but at the same time, Anne's father was ill and the couple went to Boston to care for him. Nicholas Busby was in his mid-70s by now and quite old in a time when the average life expectancy was somewhere near half of that. They arrived in Boston in March 1657 and Nicholas died that August. William and Anne were part of Nicholas's estate, and they bought some land in Roxbury while William resumed his weaving trade. They remained in Roxbury until 1660, after Anne's mother, Bridget, had died, also in her mid-70s. By this time, oldest son Nicholas was an adult, as well as a number of his younger siblings. The farm in Yarmouth was left to their care during the period William and Anne were in Boston. By 1661, they were back in Yarmouth. Neighbor troubles continued to follow William during this period, with a number of court disputes between 1659 and 1660 giving him some impetus to move to virgin land in the east. By 1663, the court had found that William was in breach of the law regarding the land in Monomoyak, although the court also recognized that William had some rights in the lands he had purchased nearly eight years previously from Mattaquassan. By 1664 and 1665, a number of events coalesced to make William's purchase of land legal. By this time, William and most of his family were living on and improving the property. William decided to become more cooperative than combative with the court and sh sugar seemed to work better than salt. The court formally recognized William's ownership of 100 acres of the land, something less than what he believed he had in the agreement with Mattaquassan 10 years earlier. Nickerson continued to press for all the land he believed he had purchased, but negotiations with the court and Mattaquassan's tribe did not have great success. Nickerson spent some time in jail while he was in his late 60s and had to pay fines and recompense during the period of 1665 to 1672. By 1672, William, now 68, finally succeeded in completing the purchase of the land. In 1674, he purchased additional lands, and at this time, more settlers were moving into the area. He also purchased additional lands in 1679, and lastly, in 1682. William established the first church in Monomoyak by using part of his house for Sunday services. In 1679, the community petitioned the court to create its own township and separate from East Ham. They were told they needed a permanent church structure and a permanent ordained minister. The petition was approved in June of that year and the town was authorized to levy taxes so that a meeting house could be built. William and Anne died in the late 1680s and are presumed buried on the hill above the current property of the Nickerson Family Association, now at the end of A. Leonard Way off Training Field Road in Chatham Port. When William and Anne moved to today's Chatham, their oldest son stayed in Yarmouth and farmed land in that town but mostly in the area of South Dennis. Even to this day, there are many Nickerson descendants of Nicholas living in South Dennis. Regardless, all Nickersons consider Chatham their ancestral home, even though William and Anne lived in Yarmouth about as long as they lived in today's Chatham. My ancestor Joseph Nickerson, son of William and Anne, owned land in East Harwich near Muddy Creek on what is today the town line of Harwich and Chatham. His Nickerson descendants lived in Harwich up until my great-great-great-grandfather, Josiah, who married a Chatham girl, Abigail Gould, and moved to Chatham. He and Abigail are buried in the Chatham Seaside Cemetery with her parents and some of their children. His son, also Josiah, married an Orleans girl, Rhoda Lincoln Nickerson. When my great-grandfather, Eli, was a child, they moved to Swampscott on the North Shore. Both my grandfather and father were born in that town, and I was born in nearby Lynn. 
Except for my grandfather, all my Nickerson ancestors have lived on Cape Cod. In 1897, the Nickerson Family Association was formed by William Emery Nickerson, a Chatham native and the designer of the Gillette Safety Razor. In that year, he organized the first family reunion in Chatham. The Boston Globe article about that first reunion stated that people came from as far away as Swampscott. Since I found the tattered clipping of that article in my great-great-grandmother Rhoda's Bible, I know they were there. This year, next month, we will celebrate the 115th annual Nickerson Family Reunion, and it will be again in Chatham.